Okay, hello everybody. <laughs> Welcome to our all day movie workshop. I'm Peter and I'm going to be your host today. And uh, yes, we have a, a bigger group today because we have uh, the participants from our Tabula Rasa online retreat weekend. And we have also our uh, movie workshop participants. So um, it's gonna be a beautiful day. I can just let you know how it's going to flow. We'll start with the movie with David, and then we're going to have a 10 minute break after that. Then we'll have our breakout rooms where you can share any emotion or experience that uh, came up for you during the movie. And then we'll have a 45 minute break, and then we'll have a Q&A session with me. So I'm gonna pass it over to you now, David. Thank you, Pete. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Oh, we have a super deep dive today. <laughs> We're going to go diving into the light together. Uh, instead of going scuba diving, we're going light diving today. And we have a great movie, great movie. I think your heart's just gonna burst open and wouldn't be surprised if you started having some light episodes the rest of the day <laughs> after this movie. Uh, it's, it's just beautiful that we can come together. And I think the reason that it's going to be so deep today is because of our topic. Uh, some of you are joining in from around the world. I'm, I'm looking at the participants in the Zoom room. We have 103 plus we have groups of people around the world. And I think probably we're going to probably have 175 of us all online together going through this beautiful experience today together, which is a, which is a miracle. And I think it's because our weekend, this is our second day of a three day weekend retreat online. And the, the title of the workshop or the retreat is This Holy Instant, which to me, that is the deepest teaching in A Course in Miracles. Forgiveness takes you towards the holy instant, the present moment, the powerful now moment that releases the mind from time and space that releases the mind from believing in the cosmos. The holy instant releases the mind from believing in bodies, from believing in separation, from believing in differences, from believing in hierarchies, from believing in better and worse. For most human beings, they just, there's such a deep belief in the ego that they say, of course there's better and worse every day. I have a better day or a worse day <laughs> than the day before, but not to the spirit. The spirit doesn't see better or worse. There is no better or worse. So the holy instant is the key to everything. And if you just right now for the rest of your life, seeming earth life, you just devoted your single minded attention to just one thing, and that one thing was experiencing the holy instant. You would be doing the greatest service to yourself, to the angels, to Jesus, to God, to everyone, just by this one thing, is devoting yourself to the holy instant. And I know a lot of you say, well, it seems kind of abstract. You know, if I'm going <laughs> to devote my life to something, David, please, can you give me something a little more concrete than <laughs> the holy instant? It's like telling a human being, devote your life to now, and they go, what? <laughs> you gotta be kidding me. <laughs> That's, my parents never said such a thing. Maybe Eckhart Tolle told me about it, but this is definitely not a part of my programming in any way, shape, or form. But I'm, I'm really sincere about this. If you, if you give yourself over to the spirit and you just say, I want to experience the holy instant, and I'm going to put all my effort and my willingness just in this one direction. I tell you, if, if, if there was smiles in heaven, there'd be a lot of smiles in heaven. All the angels standing ovation, Jesus standing ovation, Buddha, Ramana Maharshi, Paramahansa Yogananda, every saint in history would be standing up and, and going, Oh, bravo, I'm with you. I, I join you in the holy instant because that is the greatest teaching. I think 
when people ask how what does that mean specifically it just means that if you devote yourself to the holy instant in a sincere way you will begin to receive more and more clear guidance and the guidance will guide you how to unwind from the ego it will tell you where to go it will tell you who to meet it will tell you what books to read what uh, movies to watch it will tell you what to eat what not to eat it will tell you how to get your daily bread both in terms of inspiration and also food uh clothing shelter the the spirit is so practical that if you give your mind to living and experiencing the holy instant the spirit will provide everything you need in in earth terms uh, mary baker eddie is a great saint uh from uh boston area uh, and basically she basically said god has always and will always provide every human need so if you say i would love to devote my life to the holy instant really but i have practical concerns jesus's answer is i will meet those practical concerns for you I will do it. Don't think you're doing it as a body with your past learning and your education. Don't think you're doing it with your skills and abilities. I can, Jesus says, tells us in the course, if you'll devote your mind to miracles, I will handle everything else. And he means everything else in time and space, food, clothing, shelter, absolutely everything will be provided in your perception that you believe you need. So that's how it's practical. It may, it may sound abstract, devoting your life to the holy instant, but actually I've experienced that over the last 36 years, everything I could seem to need, places to stay, travel arrangements, uh, global travels in 44 countries, uh, travels around the United States and Canada, 49 states around the United States, all kinds of things that seem to require a lot of logistics, like gasoline for cars and cars and planes and and lots of luggage and places to stay and everything what a trip i got to tell you jesus is the greatest he he's given me the adventure of a lifetime for the last 36 years and and i really didn't have to do anything he didn't tell me i had to do anything he just said just be willing to let me use you and I'll come through you and I'll speak through you and I'll handle all the logistics of time and space to make it work. And so I just said yes. And then as we, uh, Lisa and, and uh, Kirsten were saying last night, it works. And you heard the chorus chiming in from the crowd last night, uh, it, it definitely works. So let's go over a little bit of metaphysics real quick. Um, how many here, when you hear the word oneness, feel a swirl in your heart? Oneness, 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 I, that's me. And what I would say is that God is one and the mind of God is one and Christ is an idea, pure abstract idea of light in, in the mind of God and Christ is one and the Holy Spirit is a creation of God, even though we talk about the Holy Trinity, God and Christ and the Holy Spirit, they're all eternal creations, they're all infinite, they're all pure spirit, and especially they're all one. <laughs> they're just really one, it's not really three. <laughs> it's really actually one spirit, one love, one spirit. So we've got the mind of God, we've got the mind of Christ, we've got the, the Holy Spirit, which is part of that oneness. And then you might say, but how does that relate to earth? <laughs> how does that relate to my life? Sentimentally, I'm with you, David. Sentimentally, I like the oneness idea. I, I'm, I'm leaning towards you, but I've got a lot of experiences in this world that don't seem to be oneness. And so in A Course in Miracles, there's a right mind and a wrong mind. The right mind is where the Holy Spirit lives. And the right mind has what we read, I read to you yesterday. It's, it has a holy image. It has a, a photo 
of a forgiven world, a photo of a happy dream where everything is connected, everything is one. In quantum physics, they call this the unified field. In the Course, Jesus calls it the happy dream. Uh, it goes by different names in different cultures, but, but the one characteristics of a forgiven perspective is oneness. In, in forgiveness, you realize, oh my God, there's only one of us. <laughs> I, was, I was tricked into believing we were separate. I was tricked into believing we had separate minds, separate bits of consciousness. I was tricked into believing we had private thoughts and secrets. You really think God would create secrets? Why would God create secrets? You know, God is just one. It's so simple. Secrets, mm, that's, that's complicated. Hiding. Secrets involve hiding. And God does not involve hiding. God wants us to have revelation, to have the oneness revealed to us as pure love and pure spirit. So when we come down to the right mind, that's the Holy Spirit's perspective on the world. The Holy Spirit doesn't see separate situations, doesn't see separate events. The Holy Spirit actually doesn't even see separate people because the Holy Spirit is the correction for the error of separation. So to the Holy Spirit's perception, there aren't even separate people. You see how high that is? That's, that's the image of holiness. That's a unified healed perception is what that is, is the Holy Spirit's perspective. And, and also in the Holy Spirit's perspective, the Holy Spirit knows that in eternity there is no time, but the Holy Spirit knows with regard to time and space, there's one important characteristic you need to know from the Holy Spirit's perspective is that it's all simultaneous. That's why there is no reincarnation in traditional terms, because you don't have a little bitty soul that incarnates and goes out and reincarnates over thousands and thousands, sometimes millions of years. That's just a description of separation. And the value of reincarnation is maybe it has a glimpse of the idea that all the souls make it back to God. <laughs> That's the good part of the idea. But the ego will use reincarnation to say, oh, you're not going home for a long, long, long time. You better get used to separation game because the ego says, I'm running the tables. And if you can believe you're a little bitty soul that's going to escape and return to the source, but the ego says, if you believe in time, I'm going to make that time difficult. I'm going to make that time hell. <laughs> I'm going to turn it into hell. <laughs> and and none of us, we want, we want to know God. We just want to remember God. That's, that's our calling of our heart. That's our prayer. We just want to remember God. So from the wrong mind perspective, the wrong mind is the belief that the mind can leave God, leave its source, and have a separate private mind of its own. So the wrong mind is simply the belief that there are private minds with private thoughts and private perceptions. You know, you probably have heard the saying, no two people see the same world. So from that perspective, there's, there's like 7.8 billion different perspectives of the world with the humans, you see? And then we have to include the animals. What about the insects, the little ants with their little eyes and antennas? If you believe in separation, you also believe that there's separate perspective, that that ant outside your yard has a different perspective of the universe than you do as a person. The good news is there aren't separate perspectives. That's very complex. You wonder why there's war. <laughs> if you have trillions of sentient beings that each see a different world, it's easy to see where they would fight with each other, you know? Uh, either as persons or animals and people or on and on, you know, it's just fragmentation. So that's why in chapter 15, Jesus says, if you would enter the holy instant, you must have no private thoughts that you would harbor or keep for yourself. Does that make sense? That if you would enter the holy instant, which is just pure love and oneness, 
you would have no private thoughts, no secrets that you would keep. That secrets are what the unconscious mind is about. That's what Carl Jung called the shadow. You see how simple it is. The shadow is the belief in private minds and private thoughts. So if you have private thoughts that are just, you can hide and just keep for you alone as a person, um, you won't know the holy instant because in the holy instant is absolute open full communication of everyone and everything. And it's, it goes even beyond words. It's just a total communion with God and a total communion with spirit where you know that you're one with God and one with spirit. That's why Jesus, you know, he could, Jesus was extremely telepathic because his mind was so clear. He had cleared the mirror of his mind and he could pick up the scribe's thoughts, the Pharisee's thoughts. He could pick up the thoughts of the Sadducee when, he had, when that woman came in uh, who was a prostitute and she had oils to, to put on his feet. And all the scribes and the Pharisees says, oh, look at this. He can't be the Messiah. He's hanging around with this kind of lady. And Jesus says, why do you judge her? They didn't even say it. They were just thinking it. But he, because his mind was unified, he could pick up every thought, like a giant antenna. You know, whoever he was with, he knew their thoughts. He knew what the apostles were going through. And he knew all their doubt thoughts. And, and so he but he was also aware that there's only one mind. So he knew there wasn't a problem. That's why sickness, sickness could not exist near Jesus because he knew it was impossible. Sickness is, is privacy, secrets, and it's fragmentation. And Jesus knew fragmentation is not real. It's just the wrong mind. And that's what he forgave. He forgave the wrong mind. He didn't have to forgive specific people, like he didn't have to forgive Herod, or he didn't have to forgive Julius Caesar for the Roman Empire. He didn't have to forgive um, any of the people that were trying to uh, trap him or kill him, because he simply knew that the wrong mind was impossible. And, you, and, and that's why he didn't suffer on the cross. It, it looked like it from the ego perspective and Mel Gibson, you know, Passion of the Christ and Spikes and all the blood. <laughs> I sat through the Passion of the Christ with my mother, who was a Christian woman at the time, and she was she was gasping every time they would they would last Jesus or pierce his things. I, I could hear her next to me. She was probably in her 80s at the time, going, <gasps> you know, because because she was reacting like that's got to hurt, but it didn't hurt for Jesus because he didn't have any guilt in his mind. He knew that guilt was impossible. He knew I and the Father are one. You know, he reached a state of perfect union. So Jesus did not suffer on the cross. Uh, now, of course, the ego is quite clever. So it built an entire religion <laughs> on the belief that Jesus suffered on the cross, on penance sacrifice. You see how clever the ego is. It, it just said, well, that's just too good. I'm just going to have to invent my own religion. <laughs> that, that, that light, oh, I don't ever want to see that light again. I'm going to invent a religion <laughs> to make sure that I never ever behold that light. That bright light is like, oh, I'll, I'll twist that. Mary Magdala, oh, that's a good friend of you, Jesus. I'll turn her into a prostitute for the rest of <laughs> all these centuries. You see, uh, you see it, it twisted the whole story to, to promote separation, guilt, fragmentation, sacrifice, penance, you know, and, and basically it glorified uh, certain ones and it, it put other ones like Mary Magdala definitely was a put down uh, to Mary Magdala was far from a prostitute. She was extremely wise and extremely bright and, and open. She was the first one to see Jesus after Jesus came back. And then the church decided to make her a prostitute for about 19 centuries. But we're here to undo some of the mistakes, you know, that, that those are just uh, ego uh, antics and tactics. So here's what I want to emphasize for you, that, that 
the presence of love is the is the escape from the ego and that's through the holy instant and you reach the holy instant by following the guidance of the holy spirit and jesus it's really that simple and your mind is so powerful that you just you desire god that's all you have to do is desire god and then the means are given you you don't have to figure out the means this isn't like starting a business where you have to decide how am i going to get my taxes set up what about the income what about the accounting no jesus is like that's the father's business is not like that it's not like an earth business <laughs> if you just desire it with all your heart blessed are the pure of heart for they shall see god if you desire god everything else comes and gets added to your mind exactly as you need it you won't have to figure it out not a single thing it's just given to you you just have to receive the symbols when they come so this world when we look at the world you may see war like the war seemingly in the world of uh, at ukraine and russia and ukraine but jesus is saying to us in the course the war against yourself is almost over now it's, it's just a war of identity the ego is telling you you're separate the holy spirit and jesus is saying you're not separate and if you believe in two voices ego and holy spirit then that is where the war is it's a war of belief do i believe do i put my faith and belief and trust in the holy spirit or the ego if you put it in both you're going to be confused because they don't teach the same lesson <laughs> the ego teaches separation death guilt fear the holy spirit teaches love unity oneness forgiveness they never meet the holy spirit never meets the ego and your mind will only meet the thought system that it's attracted to so if you're attracted to love and the holy instant you will learn the thought system of the holy spirit what does the thought system of the holy spirit tell you it says there is nothing outside you that is what you must ultimately learn but how can that be possible he's not talking about the person there's nothing outside of you as a person he's saying there's nothing outside of your mind your mind is so powerful because god created it and you can believe something other than love you can believe in separation but it doesn't make it true it just seems true in your awareness when you believe in it when you believe it it seems like the world is is fragmented like you're struggling you're competing you're striving you're efforting you're you're pushing to try to make it uh make it in the world and jesus is just saying let go uh you don't need to worry about making it in the world you need to really focus on forgiving the world and then the world will disappear and you will remember god you see how different that is than strive and focus to be a better person a better man a better woman have a better family better business no jesus is not the better business bureau jesus says there is only one business and that's the father's business the god's business of love is the only business there is and it doesn't involve competition it doesn't involve supply and demand it doesn't involve scarcity and meeting supply chains none of that uh, heaven has is nothing like this world there has seemed to be an amnesia which is forgetting god and then perceiving fragmentation but the good news is is all you need to do to forgive and experience the holy instant is to release the belief in fragmentation you you have to you have to even stop thinking of people as people as long as you think people are people and i'm talking about bodies <laughs> then jesus is saying no listen there aren't 7.8 different billion people on earth there's only one of us i'm trying to teach you a very simple lesson there is one of us and if you go toward the holy instant you will see that holy image i mentioned yesterday and that will show you that there's only one of us
because you'll see the same light in everyone and everything. Even when you're still perceiving the form, your mind will recognize it's all one, you see? So that's what we mean by holy image. That's what the forgiven world of the happy dream is. There's still a dream, you're still perceiving a dream, but you know it's one dream and you're dreaming it. <laughs> and you're laughing because you're thinking, uh, how could I, I could not believe that I could be tricked into thinking that everything was apart and separate. You know, you'll laugh at the point, at that point. Now, in order to do that, it just requires willingness to listen and follow. That's it. I mean, if you go for the holy instant, then all you have to do is listen to the instructions and follow the instructions. And then there will come a point when that will end too. You, there will be no more need of miracles. There will be no more need of instructions. You just have this I amness. I am. That's it. I am. It. You know. It's. There's. It's. You don't have to put a name after that. <laughs> those two. Those two things are, are plenty right there. That's what Jesus said before Abraham was. I am. And if it's good enough for Jesus, yeah, it's good enough for all of us. <laughs> Who are you? I am. <laughs> Say it with confidence. Mean it. <laughs> you know, that's what the Holy Instant is. I, I am, and I mean it. <laughs> you see, there's a confidence with that. So how did we get to the movie today? Well, we have a movie poll that we put out and we ask people vote for these themes and tell us which themes are most important for you. So this week out of five themes, three themes came in at the top and they were the vast majority of the vote. And the three themes that you wanted for this holy instant weekend are living from within, pray without ceasing, Whoa, pray without ceasing, living from within, pray without ceasing. That means these prayers are not words that you start and stop. It means your heart is in an active state of God, I want you. No matter what is happening in the world, no matter what the story looks like or the script, your heart song, remember uh, the, the Penguin movie <laughs> where he, He's got to find his heart song. Your heart song is God, I want you. That's your heart song. And that's what you pray without ceasing. The ego may try to come in and stop the song and say, well, you know, you've got to pay your mortgage, you know, enough with this singing all the time, you know, <laughs> you got to pay your mortgage. But no, no, your heart song doesn't stop. Your heart song for the holy instant is still God, I want to know you. God, what is your will for me? I want to know pure happiness. I want to know pure joy. Okay, second theme you voted for. Keep the flame of my devotion burning. Isn't that great? Keep the flame of my devotion burning. That's what Jesus meant by let thine eye be single. Keep the flame of your devotion burning. Kenny Loggins, uh, he had a beautiful song called Keep the Fire. Keep the fire burning bright. Just take whatever comes into sight. Don't take forever, take it through the night and believe the sun will rise with the dawn. That's all you need to go on. So for tonight, just keep the fire burning bright. Thank you, Kenny Loggins. You know the song for us. We will have to listen to Keep the Fire. That's a great song. I just to listen to that on repeat and let the tears roll down my cheeks as Kenny was singing to me. Keep the fire, David, keep the fire burning. Keep the fire burning. Okay, number three, move beyond the interpersonal perspective. You see, that's where our struggles come in. Whenever we start thinking interpersonally, thinking about somebody in less than a loving way, <laughs> what do I mean by less than loving? We're judging them. <laughs> we, oh, if, 
if they were more like this, then I could be a friend. Or I'd, I'd love them if they treated me right. Or, you know, if they just got their act together, then I would be their friend. <laughs> but until they get their act together, no. You see, this is how the ego works. And, and here, your third theme is move beyond the interpersonal perspective. Move into God mode. You're just giving your mind permission to shift on over to God mode, which fits with the first one, living within, pray without ceasing, and the second one, keep the flame of my devotion burning. So those three themes are what we're going to explore today in our movie, because those three themes had the vast majority of all the votes. So I could tell that's, that's really what was on your heart. So first I'll read just one little bit from uh, the Course, the Course in Miracles, so Jesus can shove our boat off. We're going on a journey to, today, and he's he set the sails for us, he's given us a good movie, and he's right at the edge of the lake, and he's going to push our boat off. He's going to send us off out into the lake to discover the holy instant. <laughs> and here's what he's, he's telling us. And this is from chapter 14. Once he reaches chapter 15 in the Course, he just talks so much about the Holy Instant. From like 15 to 24, he just keeps coming at it. He's like talking Holy Instant, Holy Instant, Holy Instant. And he sprinkles in a little bit more in later on, chapter 27. And he does in the workbook, he, he picks up the theme again. But this is from chapter 24. Or, or no, 14. This is from 14, right before he really launches into his full calling, like Kirsten said, he's calling us into the holy instant. This is the prelude. And this is what he said. Jesus is telling us, could you but realize for a single instant, the power of healing, that the reflection of God shining in you can bring to all the world, you could not wait to make the mirror of your mind clean to receive the image of the holiness that heals the world. The image of holiness that shines in your mind is not obscure and will not change. Its meaning to those who look upon it is not obscure for everyone perceives it as the same. All bring their different problems to its healing light, and all their problems find but healing there. In other words, the whole teaching of the Course is to bring the illusions that you believe in to the light of truth within you, and, and the beliefs will disappear, and all the attack thoughts will disappear too. But that's what Jesus repeats over and over in the, the Course, in the text. Bring the illusions to the truth. He never says, bring the truth into the illusions, you see? And as the human race, I can say, we have tried. We have built temples. We have built amazing churches in Europe and around the world. We have, we have built skyscrapers and towers. Some of you know that the story of the Tower of Babel, the attempt was to build a tower so high that you could reach God, reach God, but the only problem is God isn't in the sky. <laughs> so your architecture, good idea, but the problem with the Tower of Babel wasn't that they were trying to reach God, that's a good thing, but the problem was they were trying to reach God in form, you see? Build the highest tower, reach God in the sky. But God, I've I've been in the sky. I did a lot of flying over these last 36 years, and I can tell you that God is not in the clouds <laughs> and not in the planets and not in the black holes. God is in everything I see because God is in my mind. You see, Jesus again says, if you look inside, you'll see you're one with God, and then you'll see there's nothing outside of you. The black holes are inside your mind. The, your wrong mind, not your right mind, you know, is just, gee, it's just the Holy Spirit and light, you know, <laughs> the black holes aren't even there for that. But in your wrong mind, the black holes are in your mind, the cosmos and the galaxies are in your mind, the whole world is in your mind, 
the oceans are in your mind, the politicians, the countries, they're all in your mind. You made it all up. <laughs> Jesus says, you're hallucinating a world of separation, but it's not out there. Don't blame your mother. Don't blame your father. Don't blame your children, your partner. Don't blame the government. Don't blame the, the countries with the armies and the generals, you know. You know, but you say, wait a minute, Jesus, are you, are you, what are you saying? Is this is taking a little too far? Where are you saying Hitler is? Hitler is a concept in your wrong mind. <laughs> Where is Ayatollah Khomeini? A concept in the wrong mind. Where is Hezbollah? Concept in your mind. Where is Saddam Hussein? Concept in your wrong mind, you see? It's the same with your mother, father, sister, brother. You know, they're all concepts because they're all projections of the belief in private minds and private thoughts, you see? There's a light in you that is the answer to everything. That's why Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is within. He's just saying, still your mind and come in here with me. And, and Kirsten was emphasizing that last night. She's just saying, Jesus, above all else, he's saying, be with me. Because Jesus knows we're the same one. We're the same Christ. There's only one of us. So whenever we think of an enemy, Jesus is just saying there is no external enemies. You have no external enemies. The belief in the ego is what generates this crazy idea of enemies. God didn't create enemies. God doesn't even know what an enemy is. In the Song of Prayer, Jesus says, they, the question is, what about the notion of praying for your enemies? Because that's in the Bible, pray for your enemies. Jesus says, if you believe you have enemies, you have great need for prayer. You see, he's not avoiding the question. He's just saying that's, if you believe you have enemies, if you're not friendly towards everyone and everything, like Jesus was, then you basically need to forgive yourself for this ego belief because there are no enemies in heaven. There's no such thing as an enemy to God. This is where, there's ego misinterpretations of the Bible because in the Bible, like the Old Testament, it's like the Old Testament kind of paints God to be like, like, a, like a, a more powerful being than humans, but he still gets mad. You know, if you, if you cross God in the Old Testament, he'll zap you. <laughs> this tribe, you know, they don't behave. And if... Uh, this one doesn't is an obedient burn 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 this is not a very loving god you know i remember watching recently george carlin the great comedian and he said he said god is is always kind of upset that you're being disobedient to god um and God always needs to be praised, and, and God always needs money. That's why the ministers are always asking for money. Because So George Carlin was concluding, God must really need the money, because that's all he sees on the TV screens, you know. And all of this, and then he said, and God loves you. <laughs> you see what the, George Carlin was poking out, the, con, the inconsistencies between the belief that God is Anthropomorphic, that's a big word, but anthropomorphic simply means that you're assigning the characteristics of humans to something else. And that's turning God into, instead of an all loving presence, a creator of love and light, it's turning God into an anthropomorphic tyrant who, who basically is zapping people and then, and occasionally, it's like, oh, and God is love. And, and of course, George Carlin was like poking, what a, contra you know, what a contradiction. George Carlin, he was raised in a Catholic family. Okay, give him, give him a break. He just got so tired after that inconsistency that he decided it drove him to comedy. It drove him to try to be funny and laugh because 
and he had a lot of swear words, of course, as, <laughs> but he, he just was raised Catholic. Give him a break. I mean, you know, he, everybody knows somebody who was raised Catholic and, and a lot of Course in Miracles students actually, when I talk to them, because I travel around the world to 44 countries, when I shake their hands and I give them a hug, sometimes they go, hi, my name is so-and-so and I'm a recovering Catholic. <laughs> I've met thousands of recovering Catholics, you know, and all that means is I desire God. I want to know the God of love. And I'm trying to let go of these thoughts of punishment, suffering, penance, you know, that I've lived with my whole life. That's what George Carlin was trying to do too through his comedy was he was trying to purge these ideas of sacrifice. Now today's movie is, is very, very good because this movie is, is called Fatima. And this movie is basically going to, most of it takes place back in 1917 in Portugal, in, in the area we would now call Fatima. That's why it's named Fatima. And so I want you to let your mind get ready for that context because, because we're, we're going on a movie that's going to take us back to 1917. What was going on in the world in 1917? Well, World War I, was going on. Uh, and Europe was in tatters, shreds. There were young men coming back either with wounded, no legs, no arms, blown to bits and pieces. And if they weren't killed, seemingly in the war, they were coming back to their towns disabled. So imagine uh, you live in a rural town in Portugal, and the ones that are barely making it back are, they're damaged. They're very, very damaged. It's a vicious war, uh, World War I. This is also 1917 is right before, they had a big pandemic back then too, like we've had uh, COVID. They had a big pandemic right after this period, which was called uh, the Spanish flu. And the Spanish flu was, it was, more devastating in world terms than COVID. It was, it was a very bad, in the world terms, virus that killed a lot of people. That's coming up um, in, shortly after this movie was, was made, shortly after 1917. And so what we're gonna have is we're going to have a rural family in this context of World War I, um, just like today, they had scarcity of basic goods and needs uh, of food and clothing and shelter. Um, they were barely struggling to make it as a family uh, in agriculture areas. They're just barely trying to hang on to their farming and their sheep herding and, and their way of life. The Catholic Church is very strong um, in Portugal and as well as different parts of Europe, of course, Rome, but and the Pope and so forth, but there's cardinals, there's bishops, there's priests. And this is going to be taking place in a little town of near Fatima, the town is Fatima, where there is a church structure in place, but it's Catholic. It's very Catholic. And then if we zoom in, we're gonna find there's a family uh, and a husband, wife and children. And one of the children is Lucia, and Lucia, she loves to go away and she loves to go into the, the, land, the grazing lands, the farmlands around the, the hills and the mountains around the town. And she's, she sometimes has the task of, of watching the sheep. So she's, our Lucia is a little 10 year old shepherd. Okay, she's just a little girl, 10 years old and she's a, she likes shepherding. She likes going out and and being with the sheep. She likes being out in nature. Her mother is a very devout Catholic woman. And her brother, her older brother is in the war, is in World War I. So her mother is heartbroken 
that she her son is at the war in the war and she's heartbroken that she may never see him again and she's devastated by the the devastation happening all throughout europe you know it's just like nowadays, you know, there's a, I call it more of a little bit of an isolated war, although wars are never isolated. They, they affect people, f food, the wheat's not coming out of uh, Russia or Ukraine now and, and Africa, there's many, many starving children and wars are never isolated. And Jesus would tell us, remember the wars in your mind, <laughs> you believing in the ego is <laughs> the war. It's, it's, it seems like it's external. But in this case, World War I was absolutely devastating. The world had never seen anything like it. Uh, it was just absolute devastation and carnage. So Lucia's mother is, she's praying the rosary every day. She's praying the rosary. She's got her rosary beads and she's praying to Mother Mary and she's praying and praying for her son to come home alive is what she's praying for. And then, Lucia has two friends that are younger cousins and sometimes her younger cousins go out with her among the sheep and, and they'll just all three go out as they're just good friends, Lucia and her two cousins, friend Francisco and um, what's the other one's name? The little girl, <laughs> I always think of it. It's Jacinta. So, Here's the picture. It's 1917, rural Portugal, and Lucia's going to go out. Her mother's play, praying the rosary, and she's out with Jacinta and Francisco. Now, they are going to have an encounter, and they're going to see an apparition. Mother Mary will appear to these three little children. Uh, out in the fields. And when Mother Mary appears, she's just dressed in white and she's very beautiful and she's very young. She doesn't look like a 19 year old, 1900 year old woman, uh, which was when we saw her was she was back. She was Jesus's mother, but she's she looks very good for 1900 years. She's she is very bright and very angelic and very beautiful. And of course the children are, this is striking. Any, anyone who's ever had an apparition knows it's a very striking experience when, when anyone appears to you. But when it's Mother Mary, wow, it's, and you're from a Catholic uh, family and the mother of Jesus is now appearing to you that is like a huge event. Francesco, uh, Frances Francisco, he can't, he can see Mother Mary, but he will not be able to hear her. He's got to turn to Lucia and Lucenta, Jacinta, Jacinta and, and say, what, what's she say? <laughs> because he can see her lips moving, but, but Francesco can, can only see her. The two girls, they can hear her too. And they are listening, <laughs> they're listening. And, and so this is important. Now, how does this relate to the holy instant? Well, from what I've described, this realm of time and space is, is the ego's world. It's so thick with illusions. It's, it's just layers upon layers upon layers of illusions. And it's part of amnesia. This is a giant amnesia to forget God and to put separation in the place of oneness and love and light. You see how giant? That, that's not a small mistake. It, I mean, Jesus would say, well, it actually is a small one. Once you forgive it, you see how teeny it is. It's a, it's a tiny mistake. But <laughs> when you believe in this separation, whoa, a whole cosmos arises of fragmented perception. And so Jesus even calls it a vast illusion. Jesus would never put that word vast in front of illusion unless he was talking about the cosmos. He's talking about the entire time space cosmos, all the black holes. He's talking about galaxies that haven't even been discovered yet. It's, it's a vast illusion. 
in perception, but not in reality. It's just a hallucination because God didn't create it. But if you believe in it, it seems like hell. Don't have to worry about a fiery burning hell that you'll burn in. This is it. This fragmented perception of time and space, that is hell. <laughs> So if somebody asks you, how are you doing today? You say, well, I'm working on forgiving hell <laughs> again <laughs> in my daily life. <laughs> you see, it's not an eternal flame that you're concerned about. Uh, hellfire, that's part of the egos try to scare you as if, you know, you, you sin, you don't do enough penance, you don't say enough Hail Marys, and then you'll burn for all eternity in hell. No, the ego is quite good at scaring the mind. It's it's the master of fear, no doubt. But Jesus is saying, love is stronger than fear, so fear not. I am with you. Uh, your, your identity is secure, will always be. God, nothing can go against God's will. Nothing can change God's will. Uh, what God creates is forever. So don't be concerned about a blip that's here one moment and gone the next. Uh, don't be concerned about the hallucination Seek not to change the world, seek rather to change your mind about the world. Give it a new purpose. Instead of hatred, give it forgiveness. Uh, change your mind about the world. But don't be concerned about fixing the world. Don't be concerned about improving the world. Don't think you're going to have to destroy the world. You, don't, you aren't. <laughs> the, the ego is destruction. And when you forgive the ego, you are free of it. You, you are free of destruction forever. So one more thing I would like to say is that because we're entering the holy instant, um, a lot of the questions that you wrote in to Francis and I relate to what you're going through in the world, what's happening in the world. Um, I, I think it was Delisa was telling us um, on, on Friday, she was saying, you know, she's, she's kind of struggled through her teen years. Now she's completed her university studies and she doesn't know what to do next because she doesn't feel drawn to, uh, to working in a typical way. And she's finished with her studies. So that was her question. That was Delisa's question. And she has, her parents have expectations really the mind has expectations of the parents. The parents don't have expectations because the parents are always projections, and so are the bodies. Oh, they're not, you can't put it onto people and say, I can't follow my calling because my parents have expectations of me. Well, Jesus is like, yeah, read lesson number two of the course. I have given everything I see, all the meaning I have for, it has for me. I've given all the meaning that I believe that my parents have. I believe I've given all the meaning the society has. I I've given all the meaning to the countries and to the stars, to the planets. I've given all the meaning to Mars and Pluto. It's, it's, you have to realize there is no world apart from what you think. So if you're thinking with the ego, you're, you're seeing the ego's world. This, this is the ego's world, time and space. God didn't create time and space, but the ego did invent time and space. Also, uh, Jurgita, I think you're here, Jurgita, you, with your little child there. Yeah. And there you are. Hi. And, and you're thinking too, you know, well, I, I, have a, I have a child, I have a husband, and so on and so forth. Well, practice the course. I have given everything I see, all the meaning that it has for me. Uh, Jagita, we had Stephania last night talking about the mother, mother daughter uh, dynamic that's going on. She was asking Kirsten and, and Lisa, how do you do that? How do you, how do I deal? Portia came on, how do I deal with my sister? Well, what I would say is this movie is the best movie for that. This is the best movie for addressing the the mother-daughter or the mother-child uh, issue, because Lucia is this 10-year-old little sheep herder who wants to go out and be in the fields and be in nature with God. And basically, Lucia is, is the symbol of, of a child self-concept. 
and the child self-concept in Portugal in, in 1917 is you're supposed to be obedient to your parents and do what your parents say. And if your parents say, pray the rosary, because we wanna get your brother back from the war, you pray the rosary and you basically, you have to do, fulfill your roles and your responsibilities as a child. And children know what I'm talking about. I've met hundreds of children on the, around the world. And when I sit and just talk with the children, they say, David, can you help me? I'm in a bad situation. I'm around bigger bodies and they think they have control over me and they tell me what to do. And this movie is more like what Jesus said, except you become as little children, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. And what Jesus meant by that, he says in the course is, except you become as dependent on God as infants, little children are on their parents, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. He's using that famous teaching from the Bible, except you become as little children, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. And he's saying, you need to be so dependent on your intuition in modern terms or the Holy Spirit and Jesus in terms of the course terms that you listen and follow everything that they tell you to do as they unwind you from the self-concept. So this is not just for a child, this is for the mind that's sleeping and believing in fragmentation. And then in this movie, the, the mother-daughter relationship is pretty strained because the mother is doing all this praying to Mother Mary, she's doing the rosary to try to bring back the, her son from the war. And then suddenly her daughter's going to come in and she's, her daughter doesn't even want to tell her what she saw in the field because that is gonna be like a torpedo to the mother-daughter relationship and the self-concept. You know, in that day and age, you know, if you're a Catholic mother, you have a Catholic daughter and your daughter comes home and says, I just was on the, in the field and Mother Mary, I saw her. What? She, she spoke to me. What? She's, she's telling instructions. You know, this is not only going to be a torpedo or an unwinding of the self-concept for little Lucia, for little uh, Jacinta and for Francesco because they're going to see something that doesn't fit into the self-concepts of the world. It's not every day when your children come home and, and say, I just saw Mother Mary and she's got some instructions. <laughs> Usually. I think if I did that when I was 10 years old and I was in a Christian family and I came home and I said, I saw Mother Mary in the backyard and she's got some instructions my mom probably would have said, we're going to wash your mouth out with soap. We're going to go into the bathroom. We're going to get soap. We're going to wash your mouth out for telling a lie. But if I actually saw Mother Mary, I, I would have a crisis of faith at 10 years old. <laughs> now, the reason I'm saying this, and I'm bringing this up, and, and your Gita, you have, you have your family life. Amanda and, and Micah are there. Amanda has a grandson who's called Jesus. So now, if, if little grandchild Jesus comes home and says, Grandma, I saw the Mother Mary, I think probably, or Mary Magdalene, Amanda would probably go, oh, because <laughs> she's, she's with us in the Course in Miracles and everything. But, but we're talking about symbols can only reach you in a mind that can benefit from them. So, these are three little children who have very deep prayerful lives. They, they pray to Jesus, they pray to Mother Mary, they pray to God, and they're so open and willing that they're going to see this apparition. And then the question comes, can we even share this with our parents and our family? And when they do, I think it's, Yahinta is going to be the first one that that cannot keep quiet 
because this is so impactful in her life that she's going to speak up. And what we're going to see is people say, how does that relate to the holy instant? The entire perceptual world will begin to unravel for the families, for the families of the area. Um, you can imagine the priest at the church, you know, is not going to be happy with this. The mayor of, the, of Fatima is, is not happy. The parents of other children are not happy. It's, it's going to create a, a giant rift. And the reason I'm, I'm telling you this is because we have already talked about this. We, that was a big theme last night that Kirsten and, and Lisa were addressing. Like, how do you deal with children? How do you deal with family members? Uh, Portia was, was saying, how do I, how do I deal with, uh, with my sister? Um, and there, and Delisa, hi Delisa, we know you're, you're feeling a calling now. First you came through David Hawkins and then some of my videos and now you're here. So you're feeling a calling, but there, the thought is in your mind like, well, my parents uh, definitely, how are they gonna take this? Watch, watch little Yahinta. watch this little, maybe she's maybe like seven or eight years old. Go girl, go. When she sees mother Mary, I don't care if you have the armies of Europe trying to stop this little seven, eight year old girl because she's going for the holy instant. She's going for the holy instant. She's willing to face anything that anyone will throw at her because she loves God. That God doesn't really care. The Holy Spirit doesn't care if you seem to believe you're a seven or eight year old body or a 10 year old body or you're a grown woman or man. You know, the Holy Spirit is going to reach you and say, come on, come back here with me. Come be, see, you're the dreamer of this dream. Don't, don't be stopped. I see Amanda there. When little Jesus, grandchild Jesus comes, he wants to join in these gatherings. She's got to give up one of her earbuds because Jesus is like, give me an earbud. I want to participate. <laughs> He's not called Jesus for nothing. Don't think you have a Jesus in your family for no reason. Holy Spirit's giving you fair warning. <laughs> the, the world's going bye-bye and little Jesus, baby Jesus is part of it. So you can see, this is what I'm talking about. And, and I'm not sure if Stephanie is with it, but she was there with her little daughter uh, last night on there too. And, and she was saying, how do I deal with this? And, and what it is, is you have to be willing, when you say yes to the holy instant, you just have to be willing to let the self-concept teeter and totter. Bridget, you know, you can talk about your children. Yeah, now you're on the holy instant retreat. <laughs> And this movie is going to show you exactly how <laughs> it's going to demonstrate. Watch this little Yahinta. Watch this tiny little Portuguese woman, girl. You know, she's just a little girl. And, and then the Spanish flu comes after this movie and she, she goes away in the Spanish flu. But she's just a little Portuguese saint. <laughs> Her body, the, Yahinta's body uh, did not decay when she she got the flu and everything, Spanish flu, but she was like Paramahansa Yogananda. That body did not decay. She, she was doing this, she was doing this before Paramahansa Yogananda's body didn't decay. Little Portuguese girl said, here, I'll show you how it's done. <laughs> you just have so much devotion to God that you don't let anybody's opinion keep you from the holy instant. So she, her body wasn't necessary very long. She was here and gone, but we're gonna see her today in action. And little Yahinta is not messing around with the ego. She's, she is going for the holy instant. She's, she's saying, okay, say whatever you want. I saw what I saw. I heard what I heard, and I'm gonna speak what mother Mary told me to speak come hell or high water. Just try to stop me, priest. You try to stop me, mom. You try to stop me, friends, family. The, you, even the, the governor, the priest, the Catholic church is not going to like it, what Yehinta has to say. 
but she's she's gone for the holy instant. You see, she is not people pleasing with her projections. She's basically going to say, "Listen, I saw what I saw, I heard what I heard, I'm going to say what I'm going to say, and take it, take it or leave it." <laughs> but I'm taking it, you know. And this is an extreme example of no people pleasing. This is an extreme example of, of no private thoughts. This is like Jesus reaching us right now saying, you can do this. Look at the little Lehinta. She did it back in, in 1917 and you can do it now. You know, is there's no difference. Time is not a factor here. It's just your willingness to say yes to God and mean it and really go for it. So I will come in during the movie, but I think you're going to really enjoy this movie because this movie will show you, you have the faith and the strength to undo the self-concept, whatever that self-concept seems to be. It cannot stop you from being the Christ. It cannot stop you from being you as God created you, as pure eternal love. Okay. Get your popcorn ready. Off we go. Jesus is pushing the boat off. We've now left the shore and we are going into the deep with Jesus. And there's a little one showing up with Chiquita. <laughs> He's ready for the trip. <laughs> Hi.